everybody. My name's Amelia and I write amateur sleuth mysteries under the pen name AD Hay and welcome to my channel. So it's been a hot minute since I last filmed a behind the scenes writing vlog for you. I know the last few videos on this YouTube channel have been episodes from the Mystery Novel Nerd podcast but it's definitely been a while since I recorded a writing vlog so I think that one was from memory like I checked earlier today and I'm pretty sure it was either June or July 2021 and in that writing vlog I was writing the the candidate and I think I got to potentially the midpoint of the story yeah, I think it was the midpoint. I didn't actually show you writing the rest of the book or releasing it. In this episode, I want to do a few things. I want to tell you what I've been doing since that day and talk about the books that I've published. And I also want to do a three-chapter reading of The Candidate. So the first, the prologue, chapters and chapters one and two. So I want to read those chapters for you. Because all I ever talk about is the writing of it and I don't show you the final product. So I'm going to do that because it's really exciting. But before I do that, I want to talk about what I've published. So obviously I've finished writing The Candidate and I've published it. And this is the cover. And it's definitely a novella that hasn't changed. Like it's it's quite thin. Sorry, it's hard to put something in frame when I've got this massive microphone here. So there's The Candidate, which I've published. Sorry, these are out of order. you think I'd be a little bit more organised. So then the next book I published was Suspicion, and this is the third edition of Missing. I just released it under a different title. And this is obviously the cover. It is a bit longer now, like it is more of a short novel than a novella, but I've still called it a novella because if I call it a novel, it's I don't want the reader to feel like they're being ripped off. So, I'm, so, I've, so it's really a long novella or a short novel. But I've used novella just to be on the safe side, just to avoid disappointment. And the next thing I published, which... It was actually released on the 22nd of November and that was Duplicity. And as you can see, it's quite a big book and it's around 328 pages. So it's 86,000 words. And this is the second book in the James Lon series. If you are interested in trying out any of my books, obviously The Lawn is free and Suspicion is also is currently free the ebook is currently free on all major ebook retailer platforms. So if you are looking for a read and perhaps you want to try this my series before you dive into it, then you then feel free to check out this book. I will leave links to my books in the description box below. So without further ado, let's get into the book reading. I can't believe I've done this twice. So I've recorded this a few times because I don't know I'm just so nervous reading my own work like I just I screw up I make terrible mistakes it's like yeah I should be super familiar with these books but it is what it is but I keep forgetting to tell you about this book so I've just finished um writing The Locked Room and it's with my editor so basically this story I was hoping it would be a short story but it's actually a novella and it features an event that is referenced in Duplicity, which is the second book in the James Lon series. You don't have to read Duplicity to enjoy this book. So basically, James interviews a former professor, professor, and his name is Professor Xavier Watson, and he mentions that during their last meeting he solved a murder at the opening of his bed and breakfast. And the locked room is the story behind James sort of discovering the body and figuring out the who done it. 
and it's called The Locked Room. It's in a queue to be edited by my editor and that won't be happening until the 24th of March and the editing will start after that date, not before, so I've got to wait, unfortunately. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Before I dive into the reading of the candidate, I thought I would read the book description just in case you're curious about the book I'm about to read and you want to know a little bit more and don't particularly want to click away and read like a book description on a store website. So here it is. A murder judge, a dark secret silenced. Rookie reporter James Alond is bored and he isn't a journalist. He's an all-round dog's body to editor-in-chief Rhys Kelly, but his luck has finally changed. After ears dropping in on the morning editorial meeting, James learns he has his first ever story. There's one catch. If the story gets too complicated, it will be taken away from him and given to another journalist with more experience. Sure, it's a boring interview with the soon-to-be-sworn-in magistrate Albert Harrington, but it finally gets him out of his six-month slump as an editorial research assistant. He finally has a chance to prove himself. The following day, James turns up to his interview with Albert to discover a trail of blood smeared through the house, an empty safe, the murder weapon on the floor, but nobody. Detective Anwar Khan turns up to the crime scene and puts two and two together and believes James murdered the controversial magistrate. Can James clear his name and write his first ever story before his editor takes it away from him? Find out in The Candidates about the series. Five years before, James Lalonde was the editor for the Northampton Tribune and discovered that the legendary sword Excalibur was stolen from the home of Elizabeth James, he was a gopher dreaming of writing his first byline. The Rookie Reporter Mystery Series follows James's first year as a journalist, starting with his first ever case. Prologue. June 28, 2010, 11.57pm. Gasping for air, Albert opened his eyes. As the crystal chandelier on the high ceiling came into view, he groaned. With a deep breath, he gripped the bodkin arrow wedged into his chest and pulled. Gritting his teeth, Albert rolled onto his side. The room spun as crimson flowed from the wound in his chest. Discarding the medieval arrow, Albert reached for his walking cane. The blasted thing had finally come in handy for the first time since his skiing accident. Albert scrambled to his feet and made his way onto the antique desk and sat. Perched on the edge of the desk, he tugged on his tie until it slipped into his hands. Taking another deep breath, Albert straightened his tie and secured it around his chest over the arrow wound. With a sigh, Albert glanced at the ceiling. Don't wake her, you fool. She's 32 weeks pregnant. You'll just stress her out. That's the last thing she needs. He needed to get to hospital without waking his wife. Albert surveyed the tabletop and his study. Then he remembered, my phone. Earlier in the evening... His phone went flat after he binged his favourite Unsolved Mysteries podcast. He placed it on the charging dock on his bedside table. There was no way he could ascend the stairs in his condition. Pulling out the arrow was a mistake. Why did you do that, you old fool? Thanks to his stupidity, he would bleed to death in less than 10 minutes. The room spun. Even if Albert had his phone... Calling emergency services would be useless. The nearest hospital was 19 minutes away. As Emma's pregnancy progressed, Albert learned the route and calculated the distance between his house and the hospital. He had measured the quickest route while driving over the speed limit. What am I going to do? Leaning back, Albert stared at the ceiling. Calling emergency services was crossed off his list, so he had only one option left. Who am I kidding? I'm not going to survive this. Not at 61. Maybe if I were 20 years younger? Albert grimaced as a wave of pain swept through his body. Then he realised something. His destination was only a 10 minute drive away. There would be no traffic at that time of night. He sighed with relief. His reckless decision would ruin no innocent lives. As the clock on the mantle chimed midnight, 
Albert grabbed his keys off the desk. Another wave of pain swept through his body. He grimaced as he thrust his frame off the tabletop, then staggered across the thick carpet towards the door, which was ajar. Albert smirked as he heard his cane hit the floor. Frightened that he was going to wake his wife, Albert gritted his teeth. He clutched the doorframe for support as the room spun. Curious, Albert glanced over his shoulder at the carnage he was leaving. I've lost at least half a litre of blood. Leaning against the wall for support, Albert staggered down the hall towards the foyer. He soon regretted the foyer renovations and those shiny white tiles his wife Emma loved so much. He reached the end of the hallway. Albert wheezed. Only 20 feet left. Albert shuffled across the tiles and sighed as he unlatched the locks on the front door. He grabbed the handle and turned it. A tear trickled down his cheek as he realised he would never get to take his daughter home from hospital or kiss his wife again. After closing the door behind him, Albert stumbled towards his silver Mercedes. He pressed the button on his key fob. Reaching out, he grabbed the handle of the car door. Peering over his shoulder, Albert grimaced. He was glad that he had been too lazy to close the driveway gates when he came home earlier that evening. He slumped into the driver's seat, closed the door, then reversed out the driveway. All I have to do is not pass out behind the wheel. Chapter 1 16 hours earlier, the early morning sun shone through the third floor windows of the Northampton Tribune newsroom as James Lunn sat on his cubicle and sipped an espresso while he read the morning's edition. To his right, a pile of overdue library books and past editions of the Tribune all begged for his attention. James ignored them as he listened to the hum of the photocopier outside the chief editor's office. The newsroom smelled like a concoction of ink, paper, old coffee and mildew. The scent was nothing worth bottling, but Reese Kelly, the chief editor, wore it like aftershave, and James could smell it permeating the room from Reese's open door. Glancing across the walkway, James spotted the six foot, seven two year old Reese slamming the phone down into its cradle. It was another day at the grindstone, and James was doing anything but his dream job. By night, in his mind at least, James chased leads, solved crimes, and helped put bad guys behind bars with his page one exposés. The Innocent Dreams of Youth. During the daylight hours, James worked as an editorial research assistant for the Northampton Tribune. It was a fancy term for an all-round dog's body. Well, that's how it felt. He was a lackey. As he sipped his espresso, James watched the real journalists drag their bodies across the newsroom floor to Reese's office. By chance, James's workstation was outside that office. Every day, he got to watch the comings and goings like a pauper begging for change outside the station during rush hour. For six months, James had slaved away researching and editing other people's work and helping Reese manage his workload. But to James' dismay, all of the hard work had gone unnoticed. He was still a gopher. A mini shockwave shook his desk as Will Thatcher plopped his slender frame on the white laminate desktop. Deep set wrinkles formed the corners of Will's eyes as he smiled at James. That smile was never good news. With a shrug, James put down his espresso, then turned towards his screen and pushed his thick rimmed glasses up the bridge of his nose. With a few brief clicks, a note-taking program was open on his screen. Swiveling in his chair at a slight angle, James glanced over at Will. Wow, you're in a good mood, Will said with a hint of laughter in his voice. James raised his eyebrows. You're always late for the morning meeting and you know how Reese loves that. Will frowned. I'm also the only person in this building who's interested in writing for the culture section. James rolled his blue-green eyes, then glanced at his screen. Fine. Will shook his head. I need you to research the history behind Delapre Avi for my upcoming piece on the medieval festival. Some medieval society and the council are putting on an event, and it would be great if I knew the history. Will waved his hand dismissively. Tilting his head, James looked at Will as he continued to type. At least it sounds interesting. Maybe someone will accidentally get stabbed with a sword and make things exciting. Will leaned back as his eyes widened. Things aren't interesting for you unless someone is injured or loses a limb. Will chuckled. What? James leaned back in his chair. Have you ever seen blood? Will draped his arm on top of the upholstered grey partition. James smirked as he peered over Will's shoulder. Today might be the day. Will froze and turned to find that standing in the doorframe was a tall man whose dark hair had more than a dash of grey. His dark brown eyes were fixed on Will. I'm just... Will pointed over his shoulder at James. Reese groaned as he surveyed the newsroom. 
His daily ritual was to groan at Will for gossiping then scanned the newsroom for his next victim. Will's green eyes pleaded with James. James shrugged. Don't look at me, I'm just here to bury the bodies. Hunched over, Will slid off the desk and walked the short distance to Reese's office. Then he paused behind Reese, who was towering in the doorframe. Reese surveyed the journalist in his office like a beacon in a lighthouse perched on a rock searching the night seas. The editor was performing his usual head count and no one got away with missing the morning meeting, not on his watch. Will stood on tiptoes, attempting to peer over Reese's shoulder. My story needs to be in the next edition of the paper because the medieval festival will be held the following weekend on the 10th of July. James rolled his eyes, then studied the screen and opened a browser window. Four years of study to be someone's lackey. A wiry man with spiked grey hair offered James a thoughtful expression as he sauntered past. The polo shirt Gavin wore was his personal uniform. Even on weekends, he always wore a polo shirt. As James waited for the browser to load, a pair of hands squeezed his shoulder. It won't be like this forever. One day, you too will have your own gopher. Gavin whispered, then he brushed his hand down his polo shirt and sauntered into Reese's office. James combed his fingers through his thick, dark blonde hair and sighed. 20 minutes later, James clicked the print button on the screen, then listened as the printer spat out pages. James picked up his espresso cup and took a sip. He groaned. It was empty. Hunched over, he dragged his lanky frame towards the coffee. As James leaned over and grabbed the papers, he listened to Reese barking orders in the editorial meeting. Maybe I'll get Lalon to do the interview and shove it somewhere in the back. Reese stared at the tattered pages of the notepad in his hand and ran a pen through his thick graying hair. If it gets too complicated, I'll take it off him and give it to someone with more experience. Reese glanced up at the door and pointed. The meeting was over. James beamed as he walked towards his desk with a spring in his step. He opened the manila folder and placed the printouts on top of the pile. This lackey is now officially a journalist. Chapter 2. June 29, 8.55am. A thick layer of mist covered the sleepy Millway Lane as James glanced at his polished brown boots and adjusted his grey suit jacket as he stepped out of his car. After locking his vehicle, he trekked along the path. The cobblestones introduced James to a new level of foot pain as he strolled down the narrow lane from the only sensible place he found to park his red Peugeot. Upon arrival, he took one look at the English stone mansion, or as his inner French peasant would describe it, a chateau, and parked his cart and horse out of sight. As he reached the black iron pedestrian gate, James grabbed the rail and pushed. He shook the gate, then groaned. It was locked. Surveying the English-style front lawn, James spotted the pristine white front door ajar. Resisting the temptation to climb the stone fortress walls, James wandered along the path and entered the property via the driveway. As he strolled past the open gates, James noticed a massive dent and the scraping of silver paint on the iron fence. That will be an expensive repair. As James slipped his hands into his pockets of his suit trousers, his stomach churned and a wave of panic swept through him as he inched closer to the house. Nerd, I'm going to screw this up. James adjusted his suit jacket and tie. This was the outfit his grandmother, Valerie Lalonde, had suggested as the most appropriate thing to wear when interviewing a magistrate on the eve of his appointment. Who am I kidding? I'm way out of my depth. James took a deep breath, then resumed his pilgrimage towards the Honourable Albert Harrington's front door. As James admired the Georgian-era architecture, he staggered over a loose stone tile in the driveway. After he regained his composure, James's eyes looked over a series of blood spots scattered along the path. Following the trail, James stared at the bloodied handprint on the pristine white door. Nerd. With a racing heart and against his better judgment, James pushed the door open. A rock formed in the pit of his stomach as he surveyed the crisp white foyer scattered with crimson droplets. On his toes, James darted through the lobby, then froze as he glanced down the hall to his left. A dark crimson smear lined the hall on one side. Out of curiosity, James crept along the corridor towards the first open door. Though frightened of what he might find inside, James stepped into the study. The array of blood droplets were scattered among the sea of mahogany furniture and floor-to-ceiling shelves covered in books. Next to a pool of blood lay a lone medieval-style arrow. It was something from a bygone era of fantastical tales featuring knights and aristocrats turned thieves. 
Nestled in the front of the corner bookshelf was a polished suit of armour. A familiar medieval battle poster flashed into the forefront of James's mind. Is Albert Harrington a part of the medieval society? All the telltale signs of an accident or potential murder were present. Only one thing was missing. The body. Did the magistrate injure himself? James tiptoed out of the study and glanced down the hall towards the narrow stairs that led to the sitting room. The blood either ended or began here, and the house seemed quiet, almost eerie. Maybe they left in a hurry and forgot about me. James sighed, then headed back into the study and around the scattered droplets of blood. He paused. His blue-green eyes followed the droplets scattered across the tabletop and onto the antique globe in the corner near the fireplace. Before him lay the arrow. His heart rate sped up. This was no accident. The thick, plush carpet near the window was curled back and the door of the safe was open. A robbery gone wrong? Careful not to disturb any evidence, James flicked through the papers on the black desk tray. I shouldn't be doing this. All I need is enough information to start my investigations. A silver laptop lay closed on the centre of the tabletop. Not a single scratch was on the lid. Five more minutes, then I'm calling the police. James released his hand from the tray as a file under the laptop caught his eye. As he lifted the computer, the Northamptonshire police logo came into view. James froze. After minutes of deliberation, James slipped the file out from under the laptop and flipped through it. No matter what, he needed to return to the office with a story or it would be his blood on the floor. He slipped out his smartphone. The words no signal glared back at him from the top left-hand corner of the screen. Perfect. James took a few notes and slid the folder under the laptop. Why would a magistrate have a file about a solved murder case from 20 years ago? In the silence of the room, James slipped his phone back inside his suit jacket. He glanced out the window at the row of hedges that lined the path leading to the pedestrian gate. Should I phone in the story? Reese Kelly's words filled his mind. It was up to James to prove that he was up to the task. No phoning it in. Just chase the story that's here. With that quick pep talk behind him, James reached down and pulled the handle on the desk drawer. It was unlocked. Inside lay a leather-bound daily planner. He flipped through the pages and turned to the current date. On the entry for the day before, someone had written Rachel Spencer, 7.07am. Farther down the page, in the 9.30am time slot, a file number was scribbled. Why does that name sound familiar? After pulling out his smartphone again, James tapped the screen, opened the notes app and stared at the name on the screen, Yvette Spencer. James bit his lip as he studied the phone. A few seconds later, he added more notes to the app, then looked at the next page of the planner. Other than a notation regarding his own interview, there was only one name on the page, along with a phone number and the words battle rehearsal. After typing more notes, James slipped his smartphone into his pocket. Peering down, he spotted the bloodied handle of the walking cane next to his boot. I should search the rest of the house, just in case. So I hope you enjoyed that reading of The Candidate. Um, let me know if you would like me to read the first chapters of my other books. I will try and improve my reading technique. I did find that... I recorded this a number of times and I'm not sure if it was nerves or whatever, but I kept tripping over words and I think I think it is more than likely stage fright because this is something I've been putting off for a while and I'm glad I did it. I'm just, I'm just super anxious about reading my own work because it's a bit... I know it's like super cringe if, if, to me it feels super cringy and obviously it's something I need to get over but let me know if you enjoyed it and if you have tips for me to improve and also let me know if you want me to read the other books thank you for watching and I'll see you in my next video bye